The assault that's uh, mentioned in the title is an ongoing one. There are ebbs and flows, but it's constant. It's a form of class war by the uh, wealthy and the powerful uh, seeking to attain their own ends uh, at the cost of the common good and everyone else. It has different names at different times. It really took off in the modern period with uh, Ronald Reagan and uh, Margaret Thatcher. And it's been, uh, the modern name for it is neoliberalism, which is a misleading name. It's a, it's a set of devices to achieve the goals that I mentioned which are neither new uh, nor particularly liberal, but since the standard name is neoliberalism, I'll keep to it. Uh, the uh, neoliberal assault has been worldwide uh, harmful almost everywhere, except for the rich and powerful, that is, the designers, which is not a surprising outcome. Uh, I'll say a few words about neoliberalism later on. Uh, the target of the assault is human welfare, what is loosely called the common good. Uh, it's worth spending a few minutes on just what that concept means and has meant over the years a much contested notion, of course. So let's begin with an Enlightenment version, 19th century version, grew out of the Enlightenment. Uh, a fundamental principle of the common good was formulated by one of the uh, leading, most prominent and respected thinkers of that era. I'll quote, the form of association, which if mankind continues to improve, must be expected to predominate, is the association of the laborers themselves on terms of equality, collectively owning the capital with which they carry on their operations and working under managers electable and removable by themselves. Uh, the author is John Stuart Mill, one of the icons of classical liberalism and generalizing what he just said, uh, all social, economic, and political institutions should be under complete popular democratic control there should be no masters, no people following orders. That's a classical conception of the common good, uh, the core of classical liberalism, the center of traditional libertarian thought. Uh, that view in the 19th century was quite common in the United States as well. Uh, there was a lively and influential labor press, primarily in eastern Massachusetts, the center of the Industrial Revolution, uh, and it uh, held, along with Mill, that those who work in the mills should own them. Mills mean any enterprise. Uh, the uh, early Industrial Revolution was mostly textile mills. Uh, wage labor was regarded as uh, comparable to slavery, differing only in that it was temporary. In fact, it was routinely called the wage slavery. Now, the basic principle was so standard that it was a doctrine upheld by the Republican Party. You could read editorials quoting it in the New York Times. Uh, some groups of workers warned, late 19th century, warned perceptively, I'll quote them, that a day might come when wage slaves will so far forget what is due to manhood as to glory in a system forced on them by their necessity and in opposition to their feelings of independence and self-respect. That is, they might accept the wage labor system as natural, the system of masters and those who follow orders. And they added that they hoped that that day would be far distant well, it proved to be less far distant than they hoped, but I suspect that recognition of the demeaning character of wage labor uh, 
uh, is uh, not very far below the surface and continually shows itself when circumstances allow. Uh, labor activists 150 years ago uh, warned of what they call the new spirit of the age, gain wealth, forgetting all but self. And in sharp reaction to this vulgar conception, the rising movements of working people and radical farmers, it was mostly an agricultural society then, uh, these are the most significant democratic popular movements in American history, uh, they were dedicated to solidarity, mutual aid, and freeing working people in the industrial or agricultural or other sectors, uh, freeing them from industrial, commercial, financial autocracies. These were very powerful movements, the most democratic movements in American history. Uh, they were finally crushed by force. Class war in the United States is unusually violent by standards of the industrial societies, uh, but they've risen again repeatedly in later years. Uh, such ideas were right in the mainstream in the early days of the Industrial Revolution. But like the libertarian tradition generally, they were wrecked on the shoals of capitalism, uh, which, with which they're profoundly inconsistent. In the United States, there is a movement that calls itself libertarian. But if you look at it closely, I think you find that it's radically anti-libertarian, at least in the classical sense of the concept. That's a topic I'll put aside. You can bring it up if you'd like. Uh, meanwhile, the traditional libertarian conceptions of the common good uh, remained by very much alive. So the leading 20th century American philosopher, social philosopher, uh, John Dewey, uh, devoted a lot of his work to these topics uh, in keeping with the traditional libertarian conceptions. Uh, he held, I'll quote him, that industry must be changed from a feudalistic to a democratic social order so that workers will be masters of their own industrial fate, not tools rented by employers, in the traditional sense, wage slaves. And more generally, he held all illegitimate structures of coercion must be dismantled. That includes, I'm quoting, domination by business for private profit through private control of banking, land, industry, reinforced by command of the press, press agents, other means of publicity and propaganda. Uh, he recognized that, in his words, power today resides in control of the means of production, exchange, publicity, transportation, and communication. Whoever owns them rules the life of the country, even if there are democratic forms. And until these institutions are in the hands of the public, politics will remain the shadow cast on society by big business, uh, much as we see today, uh, dramatically so in the wake of the neoliberal assault. Uh, this is, remember that John Dewey is about as American as apple pie. It comes right out of the mainstream of American tradition, the leading social philosopher of the 20th century. Uh, the United States has been and remains a business-run society to, a, to an unusual extent among industrial democracies. And there are many effects of this. But one is that the United States has had a remarkably brutal and violent uh, labor history. It called uh, even conservatives in Europe, in England, Australia, and elsewhere. Uh, workers were being killed in strikes in the United States into the 1930s, something that virtually never happened in other industrial societies. And it goes way back. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, railroads were the big industrial investment. American railroad companies were the last among the 
industrial societies to install safety devices, even though they'd been invented in the United States uh, by the early 20th century, around 1910. Uh, studies showed that U.S. railroads had far higher rate of uh, injuries than uh, Britain, Germany, the other major industrial societies. Uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, the coal, coal mine deaths were about three times as high uh, in the United States as, as Europe. And that continues to the present. Two or three years ago, there was a general study by the OECD, the organization of the 30, 31 rich industrial societies, uh, studying social justice, the various obvious measures of social justice. Uh, the United States ranked 27th among 31, uh, right alongside uh, Mexico and Turkey, poor countries. Uh, that's a reflection of the same uh, continuing uh, uh, crucial element of U.S. society as distinct from comparable societies. The one very famous case is the international scandal of American health care. This is the only industrial society, one of the few societies that has privatized health care. Uh, the result is uh, costs are over twice as high per capita as comparable societies. Uh, 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 the uh, outcomes are relatively poor, a huge amount of inefficiency, tremendous costs. Uh, in fact, the costs are far higher than what economists measure because they don't measure the costs to individuals. They don't measure the cost to you, the hours you spend, say, trying to figure out how to get your health care, get your bills paid, or something like that. There are huge inefficiencies in cost, and costs traceable right back to the private system uh, private insurance companies haven't the slightest interest in health. They're private corporations. They're naturally interested in profit. Uh, same with private hospitals. Uh, this is, uh, uh, it, it is, in fact, an international scandal. Uh, which makes it even more striking is that it's radically opposed to public opinion. Even though there is almost no articulate voice calling for national health care, nevertheless, uh, a majority of the public, often a considerable majority, has favored a national health care system similar to others. It's usually called a Canadian-style system, but that's because the only country anyone's ever heard of is Canada. So you don't talk about it. Uh, but, uh, but it's actually, you know, Canada's not the best by any means, but uh, considerably better than the United States in this respect. Uh, Popular opinion is so strongly in favor of national health care that by the late 1980s, that's after 10 years of Reagan, uh, about 70% of the population thought that it ought to be in the Constitution. There ought to be a constitutional guarantee for public health care. And in fact, 40% of the population thought it already was in the Constitution because it's such an obvious uh, desideratum. Uh, it's kind of interesting, when you, when you get to the Obama proposal, uh, the, there was no discussion of national health care, but it did have a residue in some of the early proposals, namely the idea that there should be a public option, that among the choices people could make would be essentially extension of Medicare, the one part of the public health care system that's more or less efficient because it's public rather than private, though it's highly costly because it has to work through the privatized system, which of course adds inefficiency and cost. Uh, there was, an, uh, at that time, about two-thirds of the public was in favor of a public option. That was dropped without any effort to advance it, simply dismissed. Uh, another astonishing feature of the American uh, a healthcare system, again, due to the extraordinary power of private business, is that the government is banned by legislation from negotiating drug prices. 
So, of course, drug prices are far higher than other countries. Uh, the Pentagon can negotiate the prices of paper clips, uh, but the government can't negotiate the prices of prescriptions for Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, one exception is Veterans Administration, where, in fact, drug prices are much lower. Uh, public, there, there are a few polls on this. The public is opposed to this by about 85%. But it wasn't even considered in the Obama affordable health care uh, system, just bypassed because of dealings with the pharmaceutical corporations to make sure that they wouldn't powerfully oppose uh, the system that was uh, created. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to see public attitudes towards what's publicly called Obamacare. In fact, that term is interesting. So it takes a Medicare, which began in the mid-60s, and nobody calls it Johnson Care. Uh, Obamacare is the term, is plainly an effort to exploit the racist hatred of Obama, which is shocking. I mean, you know, a lot of people have disliked presidents, but nothing like this, and nothing like 25% uh, of the uh, opposition party, the Republicans, thinking maybe he's antichrist. Uh, that's never happened before. It's a deeply racist country, and it's very hard to avoid. So it's Obamacare. Even the liberals call it Obamacare. And uh, there's opposition to it, public opposition, even though people are in favor of national health care. But once you associate it with Obama, uh, with uh, the government, it, massive propaganda about the government uh, interfering in your lives and so on and so forth, then you get uh, public opposition to what the government, what the public favors. It's a remarkable propaganda achievement. Uh, uh, and there are many other effects of the business-run character of the society with other pretty ugly features like racism. Well, I mentioned uh, libertarian concepts of the public good, common good. Now, there are also less rat what seem to us uh, less radical conceptions. I should say again that the ones I quoted never seemed radical in the 19th century, much of the 20th century. So John Stuart Mill, as I said, is an icon of classical liberalism. John Dewey, leading social philosopher of the United States. But now those We've moved so far to the right that those views are now considered radical. And there are less radical conceptions, less considered less radical. Here's one. Uh, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of his, himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances behind, uh, beyond his control. Uh, the phenomenal references can help you date it. This is 1948. It's, the, uh, uh, it's Article 25 of uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which was accepted formally by most countries in principle, not, of course, in practice. But the United States is a little different. It doesn't accept it even in principle. It rejects the social and economic components of the Universal Declaration, sometimes very strongly. So uh, Reagan's Secretary of State, Jean Kirkpatrick, described what I just quoted as a letter to Santa Claus, neither nature, experience, nor probability informs these lists of so-called entitlements, which are subject to no constraints except those of the mind and the appetite of the authors. So dismiss it with ridicule. Uh, Mars Abram, Bush, first Bush administration, the U.S. representative to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, uh, he cast the loan veto uh, to the, uh, the right, what's called the right to development.
I wish to closely paraphrase Article 25. He dismissed this while casting his veto as preposterous, little more than an empty vessel into which vague hopes and inchoate expectations can be poured a dangerous incitement. That's the official U.S. attitude towards the rights that I just quoted in the Universal Declaration. Uh, and the social justice rankings that I mentioned before uh, reflect that stance. And it's worth remembering that this is the most prosperous country in the world with extraordinary advantages shared with by no one else. So these results are really dramatic when you think about it. Well, let's take Article 9 of the Universal, 19 of the Universal Declaration. It's about freedom of speech. It says, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Now it's worth thinking about that. The United States, in fact, has reached very high standards of protection of speech by comparative standards since the 1960s, actually not before the first major uh, decision by the Supreme Court was it in the case of the Civil Rights Movement, in fact. Uh, but it's, though it's a high standard, it has a very restricted sense. Uh, it's called sometimes corporate libertarianism. Uh, freedom of speech means the right of those who are wealthy and powerful to say whatever they want. That means the corporations who own the media that run them and so on. So the state can't interfere with what they say. Uh, that's, uh, but, but I remember, that's the right to impart. But what about the rest of the, uh, Article 19? That is, the right to receive, to have a wide range of opinion and discussion readily available. Uh, the right to impart, again, is controlled, very largely controlled by uh, huge corporations and uh, owners of the media and the advertisers who are the market uh, to which they sell their product. Every business sells a profit product to a market. Uh, the institutional structure of the media is major corporations selling audiences to other corporations. Pretty not hard to figure out uh, what, the con what kind of content will come out of that, and there's plenty of evidence to show that expectations are, are, uh, are satisfied. Now this has been a, the, the meaning of the First Amendment, freedom of speech, has been a battleground uh, throughout American history. In the late 1940s, there were very interesting high-level uh, controversies about how to interpret it all over the world, but in the United States in particular. So the question was, does the First Amendment have only the negative sense that the state cannot bar speech, or does it also have the positive sense that is expressed in Article 19, that is guarantees of the right to obtain information to sample opinion from a wide variety of sources. Actually, that's how the First Amendment was understood by, by in the early days of the Republic by the Founding Fathers. That's why, for example, postal rates were set uh, low for publications and other devices were used to try to encourage a wide range of diverse opinion. That was the early interpretation of uh, the First Amendment, uh, it has succumbed to class war, like many other uh, facts of elements of our society. And by now, the uh, First Amendment, which does have a high standard in one respect, is restricted to the right to imp impart, which means, in practice, the right of the powerful to impart, not the right to receive. And, uh, and have access. That's not part of 
contemporary understanding. Rather, it's what is accurately called corporate libertarianism. Actually, uh, it shows up in many ways. This is one of the very few societies with virtually no public media, very narrow range of corporate media, another indication of uh, a society that's business run to an unusual extent, while formally free, and in many respects a very free society. Uh, it's a useful exercise to look through the Universal Declaration of 1948 and to see how much of it is upheld here. I recall that was produced in the mid-40s as an expression of the global conception of the common good. Uh, so there are some provisions of the uh, UD, Universal Declaration, that are upheld, in fact, uh, passionately upheld. In particular, Article 21. Uh, here's Article 21. Everyone has the right to take part in the government of his country directly or through freely chosen representatives. The will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. As I said, that's passionately upheld in words. And what about in practice? Uh, one of the major uh, topics of academic political science is uh, comparison of public attitudes and public policy, which is a pretty straightforward endeavor. Public policy, you see, the public attitudes are sampled and extensive polling, often professionally done, consistent results over long periods of time. You have to pay attention to how questions are formulated, but it's mostly pretty professional. And there are interesting results. So for example, one, one kind of result I've already indicated with regard to national health, public opinion simply disregarded over long periods. Uh, that turns out to be quite general. Uh, turns out that about 70% of the public, the lower 70% on the wealth income scale, are essentially disenfranchised. Uh, their representatives simply pay no attention to their attitudes. So if you sample their attitudes and you look at policy, including their own representatives, uh, there's no correlation. They're disenfranchised. Uh, as you move up to the scale, uh, you get a little bit more influence wealth scale, when you get to the very top, which is in fact probably a fraction of 1%, a policy is essentially a, uh, determined. It's not 100% true, but it's overwhelmingly true. Uh, so what we have is nothing like democracy. We have a plutocracy. Uh, the will of the public is mostly irrelevant, uh, contrary to, and the public doesn't take part in the government, uh, contrary to the passionate proclamations of holding uh, Article 21. And the population appears to be aware of this. It shows up strikingly in non-voting. That one of the leading political scientists who's dealt with this topic for many years, Walter Dean Burnham, pointed out years ago, and this remains true, that if you look at the demographic character of non-voters, who are they? Turns out to be very similar to people in European societies who do vote, but vote for parties that don't exist here. They vote for laborite or social democratic parties. Here they just don't vote. Uh, that persists to the present. Uh, there's a very interesting article written by Walter Dean Burnham and Thomas Ferguson, professor here, a very fine political scientist, uh, on the November 2014 election, the last, last election. They did a careful study of voting. And it's, you can pick it up on the internet. It's very interesting. But what they discovered is that voting last November was approximately similar to about 1830. In 1830, the franchise was limited to property to white males. Okay? Very narrow franchise. The voting today is approximately the same. 
and presumably for these reasons. Uh, Tom Ferguson is the leading specialist on the relation between campaign spending and policy. His studies go way back to the 19th century, and by now it's kind of overwhelming. You know, but the same tendencies remain true. Uh, these uh, tendencies go far back, but they've been very sharply enhanced in the neoliberal period with the help of the Supreme Court. Uh, you're familiar with that, I'm sure. It's a crucial part of the assault on the population. And it's not just in the United States. Uh, in Europe, in some ways, it's even worse. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, hardly a radical rat, pointed out a little while ago that uh, in European countries, no matter who wins the elections, there's a range of possibilities. It could be communists, you know, fascists, whoever it is. Policies are the same. And the reason is policies are not established by the, the major policies, like economic and social policies, aren't established by the government. They're established by bureaucrats in Brussels uh, with the German banks uh, holding a heavy hand on what they do. So that's policy. And whoever you vote for, that's policy. The contempt for democracy has reached such an extraordinary level that uh, uh, a couple of years ago, the Prime Minister of Greece, Papandreou, proposed politely that there might be a, that he might have a referendum uh, to ask whether people want to accept the policies imposed by the Brussels bureaucracy and the Bundesbank. There was total fury across the spectrum. Uh, how dare you? Uh, ask your population whether they want these policies. Uh, we, they are the right policies. We dictate it and you take it, period. That just happened again after the election of a, a progressive party in Greece, Syriza, which uh, called for the population to express its views, uh, brutally attacked uh, by mainly the Germans, but by the whole spectrum of uh, uh, thought. Uh, that's uh, 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 this uh, alongside of this assault on democracy in Europe. There's a major assault on Europe's major contribution to the common good in the post World War II period. That is social democracy. We call it the welfare state. Uh, the technique that's been used is an economic policy of imposing austerity during recession, uh, even the International Monetary Fund recognizes that that makes no sense whatsoever as an economic policy. And you can see it in the fact that the European countries simply don't recover from the recession. In many ways, it's worse than the Great Depression in that respect, including England. Uh, so it makes no sense as an economic policy, and that's even understood by, say, the economists, the IMF, and many others. So why pursue it? Makes perfect sense as a mechanism of class war. It weakens the labor movement. It weakens social democracy, social welfare. In fact, it undermines democracy. And from the point of view of the powerful and the rich, those are fine outcomes. So it persists. And for poor countries like Greece, it's just devastating. Unemployment is skyrocketing especially among youth, uh, poverty is escalating, public services have been clashed, and uh, supposedly the purpose of this is to pay off the Greek debt. So what's happened to the Greek debt? It's increased. It's sharply increased. Uh, when you reduce a pr a production, you increase the debt relative to GDP. So that's actually increased. Financial Times, the world's leading business newspaper, uh, hardly radical, points out that to pay off the debt, Greece would have to operate as what they call a quasi-slave economy. Now, there are bailouts from the European Union that keep giving Greece money, and they talk about how noble they are. Who does the money go to? Uh, to the banks, to the French and German banks. Uh, maybe as much as 90 percent 
That's what the bailouts are, not for the people. What, 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 what's the background of this? Why are the banks, in, uh, why do they have to be paid off? The banks made investments in Greece, risky investments. They knew it, they're not idiots. They made risky investments. The risky investments tend to give you a high profit, but with the possibility of default. And now there is, now of course they want to be paid off after the default. If anybody remembers, there's a capitalist principle. How does it work? I suppose I, uh, I lend you money, one of you. I lend you money. I know it's a risky loan. So I insist on high interest. I make a ton of profit. At some point, you can't pay. Whose problem is it? Well, under capitalism, it's my problem. But under the existing system, it's, your, it's the problem of your neighbors, and the people who didn't even incur the debt, like the population of Greece. It's their problem. They have to be paid off when the banks uh, made risky and profitable investments and are now facing a default. Radically anti-capitalist, but you have to remember that capitalist principles and market principles don't are, are applied for the poor and the weak. The rich and powerful protect themselves from them. And they don't have those principles. And we see it here all the time. Sometimes it's almost surreal. Now, you may recall a couple of years ago in the midst of the current recession, uh, at one point, the huge insurance company, AIG, was going broke. And if they collapsed, they'd bring down a good part of the financial system with them, Goldman Sachs and others. So uh, the taxpayers, you uh, bailed them out, uh, saved them from destruction. Uh, immediately, the next step was that they paid huge bonuses to the executives uh, who had, were responsible for crashing their company. Yeah. How's that? Is that any better? Yeah? Okay. Uh, there was some publicity about it, uh, but there was an answer from people of, you know, highly placed people. One of them was Larry Summers, former Secretary of Treasury under Clinton, you know, highly respected economist. He pointed out, yeah, this is pretty ugly, but a contract is a contract, and we have to respect uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, sanctity of contracts. They've been promised the bonuses, so they have to get them. At exactly the same time, the state of Illinois decided to cancel pension payments for public workers. No sanctity of contracts, uh, no comment. These are public workers who incidentally had already paid for the pensions. Public workers, if you have a pension plan, say your union has a pension plan, you're lowering your wages. There's a trade-off. You accept lower wages in return for some benefits. That's what a contract is. So here are public service workers who had already paid for their pensions. Uh, the contract is meaningless. Uh, that doesn't have to be paid. On the other hand, AIG, which practically broke the you know, destroyed the economy, yeah, their contracts uh, are, uh, uh, you know, have, it's just a noble commitment, a religious commitment. That's a perfect illustration in a almost surreal way of what class war is. And it generalizes very far. Uh, let's take uh, the American banking system huge part, it's not, they're not really banks anymore, but the investment firms called banks. You know, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, and so on. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a study by the International Monetary Fund of their profits. What do they get profits from? It turns out they get them almost entirely from the taxpayer. Now, the way it works is uh, there's a tacit insurance policy. Informally, it's called too big to fail. It means there's an understanding that if anything happens to any of the huge banks, you, the taxpayer, will step in and bail them out. Uh, the profits come not only from the publicized bailouts, that's a small part of it, 
That means they get access to cheap credit. Uh, they get inflated credit ratings because the credit agencies know they're going to be bailed out uh, and so on. And furthermore, uh, they can make risky transactions. Remember, risky transactions are the kind that are profitable, except with a possibility of collapse. But they don't have to worry about the possibility of collapse, because you, the taxpayer, will bail them out. But that amounts to a lot of money. Uh, the business press, Bloomberg Business News, estimated the taxpayer subsidy to the big banks at about uh, over $80 billion a year. Uh, other economists, uh, you know, talk about whether the figure, what, just what the figure is, whatever it is, it's huge. So that's a major part of the economy. These are institutions that had about 40% of corporate profits before the collapse, and they're basically on a dole. Uh, they're bailed out by the taxpayer. Uh, economist uh, Dean Baker had an interesting column a couple days ago in, in which the title was something like, uh, uh, Mitch Romney, uh, has to have a uh, stake or something like that. Uh, what he was talking about is the fact that the Congress, the Republican Congress, wants to ensure that people on food stamps uh, eat cheap food. You know, they don't waste their money on good food. Uh, on the other hand, there's a whole complex system of tax subsidies and shenanigans which he runs through, which make, which permit uh, uh, officials of private equity firms and hedge funds to pay extremely low taxes. So therefore, there's a taxpayer subsidy to them to make sure that they can have filet mignon. Uh, but people on food stamps, we got to be careful about them. We're not supposed to, we have to worry about what they're doing. This generalizes over the whole society. Uh, you want to, and you're going to be hit with it pretty soon. Uh, just take a look at the uh, Republican, the House budget the Ryan budget. Uh, it smashes social welfare and the poor and lavishes the rich with uh, all kind of goods. It's kind of hidden in various ways, but it's there. Well, that's, uh, that's the way capitalism works. The rich are protected and the rules don't apply to them. Uh, the poor, the poor, which means the majority of the population, uh, they're the ones who uh, get it in the neck. Well, to understand the ferocity of the current, the neoliberal version of the constant class war, it's worth going back to the Depression, Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, there was a revitalized labor movement. The labor had been virtually crushed in the 1920s, but it revived in uh, the 1930s. It led the way, as it has through much of history, to bringing about very significant uh, contributions to the common good, the New Deal measures. Uh, there was a sympathetic executive, which helped, of course, uh, but it was primarily the uh, activism of the labor movement and other popular groups that drove the process. Uh, that's the 1930s. Then came the Second World War. The Second World War led to a wave of radical democracy over much of the world. Uh, the, the struggle against the depression, against fascism, the anti-fascist war, had an enormous effect on much of the world. And it was a big problem for the guys who own and run the world, that happened to be mostly the US at the time. Uh, in the, by the late 1930s, uh, 1940s, uh, for the late latter few years of the war, 1944, 1945, the U.S. and Britain, uh, the victors, were already uh, working to undermine and destroy the anti-fascist resistance and to restore the traditional order in uh, Europe, including fascist collaborators. That's a long and interesting story. Uh, but there was a counterpart at home. Uh, immediately after the war, the assault on labor and social welfare began almost instantly. Taft Hartley bill in 1947, its first step undermined standard methods of labor organizing, and it just goes on from there. Uh, through the 1950s, there was a major a corporate campaign to uh, undermine labor, to uh, undermine uh, uh, social welfare measures, to 
uh, try to mobilize the population to be opposed to government action, which means action that reflects, in a democratic system at least, reflects popular will and to turn power over to unaccountable private tyrannies. It's called turn it over to the market, but that's what it means. It didn't fare very well in the 50s and 60s. There was too much of a residue of uh, the New Deal achievements. In fact, uh, Eisenhower uh, state said that anyone who opposes New Deal measures would be insane. Uh, Eisenhower, by today's standards, would be somewhere way out on the left. Uh, but uh, by the 19, uh, and this continued through the 60s, the activism of the 60s did maintain and even advance the, uh, the former systems. Uh, but by the 70s, the class war was beginning to take effect. Uh, then came the uh, uh, anti-communist hysteria, had a lot to do with it. Uh, uh, there was a wave of radical unionism, was beaten back mostly by force. And by the early 1980s, the neoliberal assault was in high gear worldwide. In the United States, since late 70s, early 80s, there's a kind of vicious cycle. Uh, legislation to increase the concentration of wealth, which reflexively increases concentration of political power, which then feeds back further measures to increase concentration of wealth. Uh, we finally have the system that we're now familiar with. Uh, real wages today, real male wages today, are about at the level of uh, the 1960s. Uh, for most of the population, it's been a period of stagnation, relative stagnation, or worse. The political power, as I mentioned, has uh, shifted to what is in fact a plutocracy. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, one of the aspects, one of the elements of the neoliberal assault is deregulation, making sure that the government doesn't infer, interfere with financial institutions immediate result, lots of crises. There were no financial crises in the 50s and 60s when New Deal regulations were in place. And by the early Reagan years, you start getting crashes and crises, getting worse and worse each time. And the last one is the one that we're still in the midst of. Uh, notice that this is no problem at all for the perpetrators, because they get bailed out. And as I mentioned, uh, the taxpayer makes sure that Nothing happens to them, which encourages them to take more risky moves and so on. Uh, this is, again, basic principle is capitalism and markets for the poor and the weak, uh, state power uh, to protect the rich and powerful from the ravages of the neoliberal system. The third world, the effects were devastating. Uh, in some countries, like uh, these were called the structural adjustment programs imposed on third world countries by the World Bank and the IMF. So run through the details, but essentially these kinds of policies privatize, uh, uh, hand everything over to private power, uh, uh, introduce what's called labor flexibility, which means do anything you like to your workforce and so on. Uh, in uh, some countries like uh, Yugoslavia and Rwanda, it had an absolutely devastating effect in smashing up the societies. It's a large part of the background for the uh, sectarian, the ethnic conflict and uh, uh, the atrocities that took place in Bosnia and Rwanda in later years. And in many other countries, it was very harmful. Uh, one of the, the uh, Latin America was the most uh, uh, obedient uh, uh, servant of the neoliberal principles and it had decades of uh, uh, decline, several decades of uh, serious decline. Uh, the, uh, and the same has happened elsewhere. Uh, the, uh, the worst aspect of this isn't discussed very much, uh, and that, but it, it's critical. It has to do with survival. You just think about markets. To an extent, we have markets. It's not a it's a state capitalist system, but there's some reliance on markets. The markets have a property. Uh, if, say, you and I make a transaction, say I sell you a car, if we're paying attention, 
that we make a good deal for ourselves, but we don't pay any attention to the effect on others. That's the nature of a market transaction. Economists call it externalities, put it in a footnote. Uh, and the effects can be substantial, like even in buying and selling a car. Uh, there's another car on the road, there's more pollution, there's more traffic jams, and so on. But there's a much worse case, that's destroying the commons, the environmental crisis. Uh, in market, if you're, say, ExxonMobil, you're the CEO of ExxonMobil, your commitment, in fact, legal requirement, is to maximize the production of fossil fuel, which is exactly what they're doing, because that's the most profitable thing to do. That has an externality. Your grandchildren aren't going to be able to have a decent life, but that doesn't enter into market calculations. And the extent to which this is driving us to disaster is overwhelming. As most of you know, there's a meeting in January every year of people who the business press calls the masters of mankind, uh, the rich and powerful. They meet in Davos, Switzerland. Now, there's an annual poll of chief executives uh, asking them what are the problems they face. This last January, uh, the poll, there were 19 uh, uh, problems that made it to the poll. Global warming wasn't one of them. It didn't even make 19. 19th. Worse than that, the top problem that they face is regulation, the one thing that can save us. And it's not because they're bad people. You know, maybe in their, at home they give money to the Sierra Club, who knows. But in their institutional capacity, they have a task. Maximize profit and market share and don't care about anything else, including the fate of your grandchildren. That's driving us to a precipice, serious precipice. Now that's a very serious consequence of the partial reliance on neoliberal principles, large scale reliance, but partial reliance on market principles. Well, there have been reactions. Let me just say a couple of words about them. But the major reactions have been in Latin America, which is what happened is pretty remarkable. Uh, for the first time in 500 years, the Latin American countries have begun to free themselves from imperial control. It's very dramatic. And by now, the United States is almost isolated in the hemisphere. Actually, that showed up in the Panama meetings a couple days ago. But of course, it's not the way the press describes it. Uh, that's very significant. Uh, they've begun to integrate, to at least begin to deal with some of their terrible internal problems. Uh, that's a major historical event. It's pretty much marginalized the United States in this hemisphere, which used to be completely run by the US. No time to go into it. Uh, it's beginning to happen in Europe. Uh, I mentioned Greece, Syriza, political victory. It's being beaten down very harshly by the powerful, but it's, going, it's continuing. A bigger case is Spain, a bigger, more powerful economy where a, a, a new political party just developed in the last couple of years, the Podemos, we can, uh, it might very well win the next, next election. It's running very high in polls. And uh, on the same policies, uh, beat back the neoliberal assault. Uh, today, uh, there happens to be a march, uh, maybe you can still make it if you try, a march calling for uh, uh, economic justice here in Boston. Uh, specifically, it's uh, uh, calling for an increase in the minimum wage to $15. It's uh, so worth looking a little bit at the history of that. Uh, through the great growth periods, 50s and 60s, uh, the minimum wage tracked productivity as it should. The more productive you are, the more the wage goes up. Uh, that stopped as soon as the neoliberal assault began. If it had continued, the minimum wage today would probably be about $20 an hour or something. It's way, it would be way above what it is. Now, this demand is for $15 an hour, which is part way towards it. Uh, tomorrow there's a major uh, effort across the country pressing for the same demands. Uh, right to our north, uh, 
on Montreal, Quebec generally, there are huge protests going on with tens of thousands of people against austerity programs and also critical for us on environmental issues. Uh, they're planning fracking right near the U.S. border, public strongly opposed. Uh, there's a pipeline project to bring, uh, East Energy Pipeline, to bring oil from the tar sands, extremely polluting, to the East Coast. A lot of opposition to that, and it affects us too. Uh, these are a fraction of developments that are going on all over the world, including the United States. There's also a striking revival of worker-owned enterprises and cooperatives, mainly in the old Rust Belt, that's reviving the traditional libertarian conception of the common good that I began with could be much greater. In any event, without going on, there's a great amount of ferment throughout the world. Uh, we can join it. We have much greater opportunities than people elsewhere, and much more is at stake because of U.S. power. The rest is in our hands.